Good morning. We want to welcome everyone who's worshiping with us this morning. Psalm 121 reads, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will neither slumber nor sleep. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. And trembles at his voice. And how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands. time of desperation and all we know is doubt and fear there is only one foundation 
just have a few announcements today. Um, first of all, just a reminder that we're continuing to take a break from all our church activities this week. Um, the great thing that is coming out of all of this is that we are finding ways to care for each other um, in not physical ways, but in other ways where we can stay connected. 
Um, so we just want to emphasize that if you have any needs, whether it's a prayer need or something else, or you need a pastor for some reason, please email or phone our church office at any time. Also, if you have some extra time and you're looking to do something, um, there is opportunities to call each other as well as write cards or help in other ways. And again, just email the church office and we will let you know. Thank you. I will be reading from 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 to 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go if Saul hears of it? He will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, do you come peacefully? He said, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Elab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him, for the Lord does not see as morals. See, they look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ready and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. From wherever you be, come broken hearted, let a rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your Table. 
Come taste the grace, there's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. No Scott and Elise and everyone else who's here. Uh, it's good to be together this morning. Um, I've been asked that uh, if we could just pray, so let's bow our heads and uh, pray together. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity of just being together, even though it's online and it's a bit strange. Um, we just thank you that this is our community and uh, that we can... Uh, be together and we're so thankful that you're with us in the in these times that are difficult and that you're providing for us and uh, we thank you for that and I just pray that we would continue to trust in you and continue to understand that you're with us and and just uh, find solace in that Lord we just want to thank you um, for those who are serving in our communities and our province and around this country um, the doctors and the nurses and the, all, all the uh, folks who are in the essential services, Lord, we just pray that you'd lift them up, uh, that you'd give them a sense of peace and a sense of your strength. And uh, we're just so thankful for them. And uh, we also just want to ask that you'd just be with uh, Dr. Henry and Health Minister Dix in this time, um, as uh, there's just so much to process and so much to do. And I just pray that you'd be with them individually. Uh, in these days, and we thank you for their patience, and thank you for the, the, the calmness in which they deliver to us the information that we need to hear. Uh, we also just want to ask that you be with all the churches around our community and province as well, who are doing the same thing that we're doing, and I just pray, Lord, that uh, this would just be a, a time of blessing for all the congregations, and it would be a, it's interesting times, but I just pray that uh, you'd be with all the technology and that you'd help it to uh, just work out. Uh, we also just ask, too, Lord, that you'd be with uh, the uh, patients who are in the hospitals who have this virus and the families of those patients, Lord, who are scared and afraid and, and not sure what uh, the outcome is going to be. Lord, we just pray that uh, you would send your faithful servants uh, to surround them with uh, care, surround them with uh, just love. And uh, I pray, Lord, that we would be used to be that as well. And we just thank you for the opportunity to do that. Um, Father, I just pray that you would definitely just challenge us to be salt and light in this time and that you would help us to be encouragers. Um, I pray that our words would breathe life and healing 
into those around us in our neighborhoods. Uh, and I just pray also that you would help our actions uh, bring change and challenge to our communities. And I just pray that you'd help us to, to do that. Um, we love you. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for, again, providing for us. We know that you're doing that. And uh, I just pray that you'd be with us now. Give us all a good rest of this day and uh, rest of this service. In your name, amen. Good morning. It's great to be together in uh, this hour of worship with God. And uh, here we are in the fifth Sunday of Lent. And we have a really great passage this morning we're going to talk about from 1 Samuel. And uh, I'm so pleased that we can share the word of the Lord together this morning. Now, first we'll begin with a bit of context. And then, as we usually do, we talk about in the text, and then finally some application, what we call from the text. And let's begin with a bit about 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is the story of the transition from the tribal confederacy to the establishment of the monarchy in Israel. The first 12 chapters of 1 Samuel are the story of uh, Samuel and the drama of the appointing of Saul as the first king. Chapters 13 through 31 are the story of Saul himself and the early signs of trouble with his leadership that, and his eventual replacement by David as king. And then David's reign begins in 2 Samuel chapter 5. So that's, that's the layout, the general layout of this part of the Bible. And I'm glad that we get to look at this transition from tribal confederacy to monarchy because it's a major juncture in the history of Israel. Remember, the tribal period is something like 250 years after they enter the Promised Land. So that would be like the modern history of Canada or the U.S. from the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And the winds of change are blowing and something really significant is happening in God's nation. And that's where we find ourselves as we jump into the story at chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. And let's just say the monarchy is not going too well. The backstory here is that the 12 tribes have muscular and aggressive enemies all around them. And primarily the Philistines, you remember Samson and his struggles, I'm sure, in Judges 16. The Philistines are a big problem for Israel during and after the tribal confederacy period and they're, they're mustering for war against the 12 tribes of Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 4. Now the first battle that is joined was won by the Philistines and the elders of Israel decided the thing to do was without prophet Samuel's knowledge or approval to send to Shiloh and bring the Ark of the Covenant to the field in order to ensure victory in the next battle. The point is, the elders of Israel attempt to lead God where they want him to go. And they think, well, if we take the Ark into battle, God will have to deliver us, won't he? But sadly... The ark is captured by the Philistines and the Israelites are routed. And by the way, we're including a copy of the text of this uh, message online so you don't have to worry about getting all these references down. They'll be there if you uh, are so inclined to go back and look at them. Now, do you remember two weeks ago we talked about Nicodemus and, and how he sought to set the terms of his engagement in his uh, nighttime visit to Jesus. And in that message, I said, you see those who wish to have a God who does as he is expected to do, those who want to set their own terms of engagement with God are going to be disappointed because it just doesn't work that way. To make matters worse, in response to the defeat and the capture of the ark, all the elders of Israel came to Samuel and they said, give us a king 
to govern us. That's in chapter 8. Again, the people push their agenda forward. They ask for a king because they want a united alliance so that if one tribe gets attacked, all will respond. Seems reasonable. But Samuel is not happy, nor is the Lord. And the Lord really just throws up his hands and relents. And he says, fine, let's do what they ask. Let's give them a king. They rejected me as their king, not you, Samuel. But do warn them what a king will do. And then that happens in famous chapter 8, the warning against kings. He'll take your money. He'll take your land. He'll take your livestock for his courtiers and his war coffers. He'll take your sons off to battle and your daughters as perfumers, cooks, and bakers, it says in chapter 12. But still, the people refuse to listen and the monarchy project goes forward. Well, let's talk about the persona of Yahweh here for just a moment. In this story, he's not that distant, transcendent figure that we tend to think of in Trinitarian theology. Even in the New Testament, we find that God is sort of off stage, directing things from a remote place of omnipotence. He uses Jesus and the Spirit as his presence, capital P, in the world. Yes, there's a transfigured Christ. There's a bat coal, a voice from heaven, but never really God himself on the scene. But it was not so in those early messy days of the tribes and monarchy. Yahweh is right in there mucking about with the people, dealing with their self-will and disobedience, evincing divine exasperation, working back and forth with his people, sometimes rewarding them, sometimes punishing them. It's very hands-on. It's very parental, even motherly, this Old Testament Yahweh. And you see that here. One person said, it is God's reluctant agreement to kingship. Fine, let's give him a king if that's what they want. So... Saul is anointed king in chapter 9 of Samuel. And there's this amusing narrative thread on Saul up to chapter 16 where our reading picks up today. And it, it just seems like he was a bit of a Fabio in appearance. And in 9.1 it says Saul was a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. And he stood head and shoulders above everyone else. In chapter 10, when he, Saul, took his stand among the people, he was head and shoulders taller than any of them. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the one whom the Lord has chosen? There was no one like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, Long live the king. And even Samuel seems to be quite taken by, these, by this tall, handsome fellow, Saul. Initially, the change in Saul's life was dramatic. God gave him another heart, says in chapter 10. And after his anointing, he even danced and twirled and sang with the prophets in a prophetic frenzy. And everybody who knew Saul said, well, is Saul also among the prophets then? But problems soon began to emerge in Saul's reign. Oh, there were major successes over the Philistines. Um, chapters 5 to 7 in Samuel and the Amalekites in chapter 15. But the decline in Saul's kingship was a mixture of impatience and hubris. He did not wait for Samuel at Gilgal and offered a burnt offering. There was rash action. He vowed to kill anyone who ate from the spoils um, but his, his son Jonathan did when they battled the Philistines. Saul was actually a weak leader. And in chapter 15, when God specifically commanded that the Amalekites, the spoils be destroyed, he let the people take them anyway, made excuses. So the word 
of the Lord came to Samuel. Um, and he said, I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me, and he has not carried out my commands. So the old king must go. The new must be chosen and installed clandestinely, and you see how messy it all is. You see how human it all is. So Samuel travels secretly to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse at God's direction, for one of Jesse's sons will be the new king. And that brings us up to Samuel chapter 16. Now when they came, it says, Samuel looked on Eliav, the oldest and tallest of Jesse's sons, and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before us. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord doesn't see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the heart. But as he brought the rest of his sons by, I like the one named Shema, which is Hebrew for listen, which I always thought was a good name for a child. It just saves so much time. The Lord has not chosen any of these, Samuel said to Jesse. Are all your sons here? And he said, well, there remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, you send and bring him. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes, and he was handsome too. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him, for he is the one. Now it's true he was handsome. But he was short, so tall Saul, small David. He was just a boy, really. Yet one writer said, David represents the highest expression of kingdom under the rule of God. For God looks on the heart. And how foolish we appear when we are preoccupied with how we look on the outside and we neglect the health of the heart. Besides, with all the salons closed in five or six weeks, we'll know what everyone's real hair hair color is anyway. Now, there's several points I'd like to make from the text this morning. Three of them, actually. The first point is this. I find in this passage, in this story about the transition from the confederacy to the selecting of a king and how that, how that goes in its initial years, I find a juxtaposition of two attitudes. And it seems to me that this is what the story has to teach. We have on the one hand the frightened elders of Israel rashly deciding to force God's hand by bringing the ark into the camp. The next mistake, or I suppose we would say the next sin, is to demand the king and failing to rely on God as their king. And once they get what they want, you know, you do have to be careful what you pray for. The new king is himself impatient and proud, offering his own sacrifice when Samuel doesn't show up on time failing to follow Yahweh's explicit instructions about the spoils of the Amalekites and rashly vowing to kill anyone who partakes of the spoils after a battle with the Philistines. In contrast to all of this, you have the simple heart of a small boy. And God says to Saul, The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and the Lord has appointed him to be the ruler over his people because you, Saul, have not kept what the Lord commanded you. These are not clever schemes or maneuvers by which we walk with God, but by purity and simplicity of heart 
like we see in this young boy. Now, the second point is about the paralysis of emotions and heart that can attend a time of crisis. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I've rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Now, I think this speaks to a couple of things. It's interesting how Samuel, a prophet, the great seer, First Samuel calls him, is prevented from moving on with God's will because of a grief that is keeping him locked in the past. He appointed Saul. He just can't get over how the project failed so terribly. And the stakes are so high. And Samuel grieves. But God is calling him forward to corrective action in the middle of that. And God says, fill your horn with oil. Oil is what you use to anoint a king. Fill your horn and set out, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. God has his ways. I think the point here is pretty obvious. When you have a crisis, you get up, you eschew paralysis, you get moving, and you set out with social, proper social distancing. This isn't just positive thinking. Maybe it is positive thinking. There's nothing wrong with that. But it isn't just that. It shows how God's way sometimes moves through and around obstacles to accomplish his purpose. And it shows that plans can change when there's disruption. Either human disobedience, in the case of Saul, which seems to me led Yahweh to shift to another plan, David as king, or a seeming catastrophe of a pandemic, or a loss of income, or persecutions in Jerusalem that drove the disciples out and away from their familiar setting and so set the gospel on its global path. Plans can change, but God is in it all. And the deciding factor as to whether things continue to move forward in God's will is the heart of determination of his servants. Fill your horn with oil. Set out, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And finally, this point. We have to take care of our hearts through a time like this. I understand that there's a new, um, a, a new thing kind of going around uh, on the internet called Protect Your Heart. And it's funny because it was started by a rapper, but it's based on Proverbs 4.23, which says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The elders of Israel didn't. Saul didn't guard his heart. But David did. As we must. And David Brooks in a New York Times article on Thursday um, said this. When our life plans are upset, when our plans fall away and we realize that we are not in control, we find there's a quieter and better you beneath those shattered plans. There is a quieter and a better you beneath those shattered plans. Now, we are Christian realists. 
We must be. We have just been through the pandemic week that was. And to be honest, there's another one waiting for us next week. And probably the week after that. In the past two weeks, no. In the past two days, everything has changed. And there are innumerable things going awry as the pandemic spreads. And it seems to me just like how Ernest Hemingway described his going into bankruptcy. He said it happened gradually and then suddenly. Oh, we're realists. We know that 80% of those who contract the virus will have a mild illness. We know that another 15% will be quite serious. And only 5% will become critical. But it's that last 5% that really matters. We're realists. We know that flattening the curve is about slowing the pace of the pandemic so as to spread out the demand on our health system. This is serious business before us. We are duty-bound to observe all the canons of public conduct to limit the spread of the virus if we can in any way possibly do that. And we also know that we will work our way through this and around this in time and that life will return to sanity by God's grace. This past week, Reminds me of the 19, 1970 mission of Apollo 13. The spacecraft was halfway to the moon. They radioed mission control with this sentence, Houston, we have a problem. And in the 1995 movie version, Ed Harris, he's got his brush cut. He's got his white shirt with you know, short sleeves. He's got his pocket protector. He's the flight director. And as the system failure lights begin to flash all across the room, the flight center erupted into chaos. And Ed Harris steps up and he calls the room to order. And he says, okay, people, listen up. Let's approach this from the point of status. What's working on the ship? Well, what's working for us? What's going well? Let's focus on those things. Even though the human situation is messy beyond belief, our disposition doesn't change from what it's always been. We will trust in God and we will love one another. No change. It's where we were in February before this hit. It's where we must stay in March. And it's where we're going to be in April and May. And as long as we need to go, there is no change in our disposition. We're doing everything we can right now to flatten. And we'll continue to do that. And we will trust in God. And we will love one another in the process. And amazing things are going to come out of that. But you know, I think there's one thing that may well change from this crisis. It could be our definition of one another. There are several things David Brooks said in his article this past Thursday that I think belong in a sermon this week. Brooks speaks of social solidarity as something that is the top of mind for everyone right now. The fact that people in Seoul and Milan and New Jersey, and I add Vancouver Island, are connected by a virus that reminds us of the fundamental fact of human interdependence. Social solidarity, says Brooks. It's an active commitment 
to the common good. The kind of thing needed in times like now. It isn't a feeling. It's a virtue. And he goes on to say, we'll need a great reset when all of this is over. And we need to start planning a great social festival and ask the obvious questions. Why did we tolerate so much social division before? Why didn't we cultivate stronger social bonds when we had the chance? And all of those us-them tribal stories don't seem quite so germane right now. And he asks what I think is the question of the day. Will there be an enduring shift in consciousness after all of this? And we want to be there with our trust in God and with our love for one another answering today's need. And we've been saying here in this Lenten season that we should do this. We should fast from thoughts of illness. Feast on the healing power of God. We should take care of our heart by fasting from worry and feasting on unceasing prayer. We should fast from anxiety and feast on hope. What an amazing opportunity do we have to do that among ourselves and in our community at this time. And we need to take care of our heart and for a time fast from our preoccupation with ourselves and feast on that silent hope of trust in God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Well, Lord, our need is so great in this day. And we are facing things that even a few days ago we couldn't have imagined would be before us. Never was there a time when we all needed to pull together as a people. Not just as a church, but as fellow citizens across Canada and around the world to do everything we can to preserve our way of life to keep people from illness and to heal those who need care. We ask you, God, to descend upon us, to carry us through these days, and at the same time put, put hope in our heart and help us to see that nothing has changed, that we will go on to trust God and love one another. And we'll do it in Jesus' name. Amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine meeting on the everlasting arms. What what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms leaning, leaning safe and secure from all alarms leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting Yes.
And now, may the Lord, who is your shepherd, fulfill your every need. May he lead you to green pasture and give you rest beside the still waters. May he restore your soul and lead you in right paths for his name's sake. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you go into this week, may God be with you. Take good care of your heart. Find someone to reach out to and love who is near you. And we'll see you back here next Sunday for another time of worship.